So thanks, uh, Lotlana, for the nice introduction. Thanks for organizing this summer school, for inviting me. Thanks to the other co-organizer of this uh, summer school, um, to whoever wanted to wake up so early in the morning to assist to this lecture. So let's move to the topic of this uh, presentation, which is goal-oriented wireless communication for agile-assisted machine learning. But before going to the topic, let me acknowledge contributors of the work that I'm going to present, which is a group from, mixed group from University of Roma La Sapienza, led by Professor Sergio Barbarossa and uh, Paolo Di Lorenzo, which is an associate professor over there. Then my PhD student, Francesco, which has been forced to work till uh, last night uh, to produce the last results I want to show today. And, uh, but on top of the acknowledgement of this, uh, let's say, professional collaboration, I want to mention that it is uh, a network of uh, friends and professional uh, persons. So uh, it's a network that was uh, initiated by this guy, which is Professor uh, Saverio Capcopardi, which was my professor at the uh, University of Perugia, my PhD advisor, retired some years ago, but still uh, alive in uh, the department. And he's the initiator because he was uh, formerly Sergio's Barbarossa colleagues in uh, Roma La Sapienza. Then Sergio came to Perugia and was my professor uh, when I was a student in Perugia. And then uh, Paolo Di Lorenzo, formerly uh, PhD student of Sergio, came to Perugia to be an assistant uh, professor some years ago, and now he came back to Roma La Sapienza. So this is something that is going on since the late in the 80s, uh, and I wanted to let you know that we are kind of happy to still work together. So thanks to all these guys, and hopefully Francesco will continue to propagate this uh, network uh, of uh, connections between the, the two groups. The outline of the talk, so I will give a brief introduction to the scenario motivation. We are at the last day of the school, so we are aware of what we are talking about, so maybe I can skip some of the details here. Uh, brief introduction to goal, and don't call it semantic uh, uh, communication, otherwise Professor Fermides will uh, get mad. And uh, then I will go to dynamic resource management for goal-oriented communication, which is the real uh, topic of this talk. Some result for uh, dynamic resource management of a practical goal-oriented communication system that we proposed recently in collaboration with uh, uh, the La Sapienza guys, and then some future research uh, direction. So just to be clear, it is clear at the end of this uh, summer school that machine learning and communication are well in uh, interbeated and connected, uh, and uh, they play a big role together in uh, shaping the future of the society in our everyday life. But they can be divided into big frames, interleading with, between them, interconnecting between them, which is communications for machine learning and artificial intelligence application, or the other way around, how to use machine learning and artificial intelligence applications for communication. And obviously, the two things uh, live together, but today we are going to talk mostly about the topic of communications for uh, machine learning applications. So the motivations are clear. We live in a era with uh, pervasive uh, networks uh, uh, that interconnect all of us uh, and also all of us with machines uh, and with the virtual world and uh, whatever we, we know. But And the connected users are foreseen to grow probably at even higher pace of rate that is shown in this graph that predicts for 2030 this number of connected users. So these uh, connected users are no longer personal users, but are, as we know, machine, Internet of Things devices, which produces a lot of data. And the big topic around the last 10 years is how to make knowledge out of this data. So big data analytics, uh, artificial intelligence to do this, machine learning. Uh, and the whole topic of estimation, uh, hypothesis testing, that we are all using as signal processing guys. The solution to handle all this huge amount of data has been typically to uh, rely, and still is to rely on uh, cloud services, which are, however, in uh, the deep core of the network. And this solution alone cannot obviously handle all the new uh, challenges that we are facing with this huge increase of data, huge increase of uh, users, and also a huge increase of services that has to be uh, delivered. So this solution alone does not scale well with this huge amount of data. All this data should basically 
flow through all the networks and will collapse the network uh, in just a few seconds. And thus, on top of the cloud architecture, it has been proposed and added a new uh, architecture, which were some edge nodes closer to the users, are equipped with intelligence and are capable to give these services to the users in a probably faster way than uh, cloud computing architecture because they are closer and in a more distributed and so more sustainable way and easy, more easy to scale and so far and so forth. And another thing uh, about this is that you are used, you are closer to the users so also the privacy concerns that I will not touch upon today are less stringent because your data are not going through all the networks but maybe are just on the edge of the network. So this edge intelligence and probably what we are building today is the long-term vision of Nikola Tesla of the, back in the 1926 when he was saying that when the wireless was fully deployed, basically the world will be a big brain of interconnected agents and intelligence mimicking what our small brain and our head is doing every day. So how to do it? Obviously, this edge intelligence needs some enablers. The edge devices are one of these enablers that we will talk about today. Wireless communication is the big topic uh, I'm tackling today as an enabler. And let's see what, are, what is this scenario uh, I was mentioning so far, and what are the resources that we have to handle in edge machine learning. So the simple scenario we'll always refer about today, the simple one, we have uh, user equipment that generates some data and some task that he wants to do with this data. Let's say the simple example, uh, I'm having images that I want to classify, I don't want to do it by myself for several reasons, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough energy, uh, I don't have enough uh, power speed in uh, my uh, user terminal, so I will send through a wireless link to the edge server, which will do the job for me and send back the answer if I'm the intended recipient of the job, or send the answer to whoever is interested to, to this answer. And the resources are obviously, as I was mentioning, the energy for computation that we have at the user equipment, the same energy to compute that we need at the edge server, we need computational speed, so as fast as I can process data as soon as I will have the result back. And the computational speed, obviously, of the edge server will be much higher than the computational speed of the user equipment. So this will uh, can easily compensate in several situations the delay of uh, sending information to the edge server. The resources of the classical uh, wireless communication link, which are the transmission power, the bandwidth, and I would say these are, sorry, um, PDF, I lost the parentheses, but the classical capacity formula that links the two and tells me theoretically which is the maximum rate I can transmit through uh, this is an AWGN channel capacity but we can extend also to other kind of capacity. So uh, what we need to do then uh, in terms of design and management in edge machine learning we have to manage the radio communication part so the energy, the bandwidth, the channels we are using for a single user or the channel that we want to use to sh and share among multiple users. Ah, dynamically exploit the channel conditions. If a uh, user has a better channel than another one, we may then uh, prioritize the one that has the good channel and things like that. Then we have to do computation management because now we are not talking anymore about communications and uh, computation as two separate entities. They have to be blended together and the resource management has to be done jointly. And we have to, so, uh, to consider the computational complexity but also the energy that we need about this computation. What we have been talking during these uh, two, uh, five, four days of the school, we are talking a lot about the fact that artificial intelligence can help us in several respects in both the paradigm, machine learning for communication and communications for machine learning. But we didn't mention too much that this comes at the price of a complexity and that's a, at the price of energy consumption. And so we have to take 
into account also this aspect in order to manage all the resources. And I will propose some initial way to do it. You can do it in a more sophisticated way, obviously. And then obviously, uh, key performance indicator, if we are talking about a goal which is uh, uh, to learn something, to classify something, is the accuracy you are doing your job. And also the other, I would say, key performance indicator is latency. There I was uh, saying low latency because all of us typically think about the nice, almost real-time services that we would like to have through this kind of architectures, but I would say it's not all important when you, have, you need low latency. Any service you are going to request has its own latency request. And even be too fast in terms of latency for a service would mean that you are not exploiting the overall results of this system in the right way. And you are giving too much resources to someone that does not need. So having a target latency for any kind of communication is something that you have to put in your, your design problem. And all these uh, resources are competing one with each other. You cannot have any lunch for free. If you push uh, in one direction, you are losing another one. And these are the typical trade-offs conceptually between the latency, energy, and uh, accuracy. If you have more energy sensitive, you can get a better job uh, in terms both of transmissions, transmission energy, then computation, and have a better final accuracy. If you have more time to process things, you can probably uh, obtain a better accuracy, but if you want to have uh, a very low latency, then you need probably to push a lot in terms of energy. So this has been well uh, explained. Also, this picture comes from this paper of the Sergio Barbarossa's group in uh, Roma La Sapienza, which is well research machine learning, resource allocation and trade-off, where it was in 2000 one introduced a framework to handle these things in a systematic and theoretical way with a nice uh, mathematical framework for uh, optimization, which is the of optimization we will rely upon in the next slides to explain what we did. <coughs> so this goal-oriented communications, although it is a new word, a new buzzword that, or semantic communication, that recently appeared and is attracting a lot of research is over there in terms of conceptual, at least, uh, uh, introduction since back in the 50s, let's say in the late 40s. And Shannon and Weaver already in their seminal papers, they've been talking about the technical level of communications, which is the one that we are most used to and where information theory uh, was the tool to address this technical level and has attracted research in the last 70 years, but also the semantic level and the effectiveness level. So the semantic level uh, is related to what you want to communicate and not just to the data that you use to communicate this information. And obviously, uh, what I'm communicating today to you may be important or not, depending on what, uh, how much you are interested in what I'm saying, depends on how much what we are tuned with prior knowledge, and the use of this prior knowledge can be used to detect the semantic and the content of uh, my communications. But just to be uh, clear, if I convert my voice uh, with classical uh, techniques uh, to file, uh, to bits, uh, and then I send my voice uh, through the network, and then I receive my voice, there is a huge difference between the information, which is the syntactic information that we use in a classical uh, communication system, and the semantic, what I want to mean. So I could even talk for hours saying almost nothing with not so much uh, semantic communications, but with a lot of information from point of, uh, with a lot of data from the point of view of technical level. So I don't want to be too much, spend too much time in this uh, um, philosophical view also, but this is uh, again another paper of Sergio's group, C 6G Networks Beyond Shannon Tower Semantic and Goal Oriented Communication, which is a, a vision paper, not a technical paper, where all these concepts are much better explained than what I was able to do in just a few seconds. And so the basic 
thing is how to perform goal-oriented communication, which in an essence is how to compress as much as possible the data that I have to transmit to deliver the real content of the communication, what is really useful to me or to the receiver to perform an action. And what I forgot to mention, what the, I'm communicating will become really effective if all this process is uh, well managed by the effectiveness level, which in our engineering world could be control, control of the network and make possible that this, all these uh, three levels cooperate in the right way and we make the best use of all the resources. There have been uh, quite recently several papers in the last one, two years, I could mention 20 papers or even more, where several proposals uh, emerged how to do this, mostly based on uh, deep neural networks. I will just briefly mention some of them in the following, but I want to point your attention to uh, an interesting and inspiring theoretical principle, which is the information bottleneck principle, which was introduced in 1999 by Tishby and his collaborators. And what is the information bottleneck? The information bottleneck is just a theoretical problem that says how, uh, if you have a random variable x that has some statistical information uh, about a random variable y, I, how can I generate a random variable t that preserves great part, if not all the information statistical that X has about Y, while reducing, let's say, its, its size, so its uh, entropy. So in such a way that I can code it with the less number of bits. Well, this is formulated this way, a possible solution to this problem, which is a variational optimization problem, where it tries to uh, balance two opposite uh, requests. One is the request that T uh, maintain the information that he has about X, so great part of the information of X goes to T, but not all the information, just the minimum one that then is useful to uh, predict or to have statistical knowledge about Y. So minimizing this quantity without this penalty will give you the trivial solution, just to zero. Minimize the mutual information, just do something that is uh, statistically independent on X, uh, on X, no mutual information. But then if you put a penalty, you say, okay, I want to have a guaranteed mutual information between T and Y, so this is, we have the minus, the beta is uh, a trade-off parameter that is uh, strictly positive. Then changing the beta, you can trade between these two opposite uh, goal, reducing the complexity, so the mutual information between T and X, while this mutual information that you maintain is the one that is useful because it gives you the mutual information with Y. Okay. Sorry. I have a question related to this. So, um, you said, okay, I can take T random and then I is uh, minimal, right? Yeah. So the first term is minimal, but then, okay, I can also take Y then equal to T, and then the second yeah, term No, 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 but why you, you, I mean, Y is there. So if you um, want to use X. Uh, y is also train is given, okay. Yeah. You have X and Y, yeah. let's say. Uh, no, no, then it's true, yeah. Okay, so. But they're not the same. Uh, no, no, not the same. same. There are two points, so let's say uh, the random process that generates an image, and the Y, the decision that you can take about classification of an image, this can be modeled as a random quantities. Then you want to generate another random things that is related to the image, let's say the features, what we are looking at, that preserve the useful information about Y, which is the classification that we are But there should be a correlation between X and Y somehow, right? No, there should be at all. I mean, otherwise. we are talking about, yes, I mean, we are talking about two things that are correlated. If they are independent, yeah. that's it. So what you need, basically, you need the knowledge of the Statistically, you need the knowledge of the joint probability density function of X and Y. And once you know this statistical knowledge between the two, you want to exploit 
and what you are looking after, basically. These are quantities that are computed by expectation, which involves all the joint and conditional uh, probabilities of these three variables. So basically, what you want to optimize is a mapping, which is a statistical mapping. It's not uh, a deterministic mapping. From x to t, you want to optimize, basically, with respect to the joint probability of x and t. But the joint probability obviously depends on the marginal probability of t given x, sorry, on the conditional probability of t given x, and on the marginal x. You cannot play with the marginal x because, because it is what nature gives you, so you want to design, as you do with the capacity in the communication channel, you want to find a probability that maximizes this, uh, this quantity. Okay, this thing is strictly related to rate distortion theory, which is when you have this random variable x, you want uh, to generate a compressed, a compact representation of x uh, with a tolerated amount of distortion. And the formalization of the problem is quite similar because you do this under a prescribed distortion, distortion loss function for a rate distortion theory, typically the mean square error, let's say, between t, that is the compressed version, and x, which is the original version. Here, in this case, it has been proved that you can reinterpret the information bottleneck uh, uh, principle as a particular case of, not a more general case of rate distortion theory, where you do not force at the beginning, which is the rate distortion that you want to take under control, but it ends up from the solution that is equivalent to a problem where you impose as a loss function the Kullback library of divergence between y given x and y given the compressed distortion. But obviously, uh, the optimization function, which is uh, the p of uh, uh, t given x, which is within this function, it is still within the function. So this is something that you understand at the end of the process that not, uh, you cannot impose. So uh, the problem is a little bit more complex algorithmically than uh, rate distortion theory. We need a good knowledge, a good estimate of the joint probability density function. In this respect, Professor Tonello's talk about a good estimation with uh, deep neural networks is inspiring for uh, deploy what is called as a variation of information bottleneck principle. The solution is generally unknown, except uh, two cases, when the jointly Gaussian distribution of x and y, so x and y are jointly Gaussian, then the solution is easy, let's say, and uh, the mapping is linear, also t is Gaussian, and it has a closed form solution. As always happens in information theory with Gaussian uh, random variables. The other case when you may say that the solution is known is uh, when uh, the two random variables, x and y, are in a discrete domain, then there are some inter leave the equations that the solution has to, uh, has to respect, then you have to play something of a, a fixed point algorithm to converge to the solution, which is something really similar to the blout harimoto algorithm that is used in uh, rate distortion problems. So what is the solution in the case of jointly Gaussian random, vector, uh, random vectors? X and Y with zero mean, but you can obviously generalize to non-zero mean with covariance matrices uh, Cx and Cy, and joint uh, cross-correlation matrix uh, Cx, Y, and this conditional, if you want, uh, correlation matrix. Then the mapping is linear. So you generate T as a linear transformation of, we are moving to a vector of random variables, and not only a single random variable, as I was talking before. You take x, you project in another space by this capital matrix A, and then you add some noise. So this is uh, not a deterministic mapping, it's a, let's say, a statistical mapping. How this matrix is built? So the structure of the matrix is one of these possible structures where these are the rows of the matrix. So when B is very small, which means that you are not imposing in the original problem that you want to maintain some information that x had about y, you don't care too much. Then you have the trivial solution, just put capital A equal to the zero matrix and you just forget about, about x. 
But when B starts to increase and overpass a given uh, critical value, then you start adding a first row to this matrix, and basically you are collapsing all the dimension of X in a single dimension of the new random variable that you generate. And as much B increases, you start adding a second row, a third row, and up to the level when B, uh, B sorry, beta is uh, really uh, high, then you have a full matrix. What are these vectors, these, those rows? Well, are scaled version of eigen vectors of this matrix. And this matrix, the product of these two, is the matrix that also come up when you talk about canonical correlation analysis for Gaussian random variables. And they are scaled by these coefficients, each one of them, alpha sub i, which depends on the structure of this matrix through the eigenvalue and the beta. And the critical values itself depends on the eigenvalues of this, uh, of this matrix. Okay, this was proved in 2003 by the same Tishby. So, yes, I, I kind of miss intuition to why this works. So, yeah, can you elaborate a little, like maybe a few sentences on why does this work or why is this the optimal encoder? Okay, uh, the intuition is as much as you increase uh, the beta parameter, you are going to a random variable, T, which has, uh, which lives in the informative part in a much always higher uh, subspace dimension. So I say that when beta is really small, you don't care too much about having all the information that x has about y. So you put the information that x has in n uh, components just in one component, which is the first component of the vector t. But then, then it's really weird that if beta is lower than some value, then you still assign zero, all zeros to all zeros. So you don't put any information of x. But then, but then, but then beta or beta is non-zero. But then still you assign a zero matrix. It has to be greater than zero, huh? beta. Yeah, yeah. But then for beta greater than zero, so if beta is greater than zero, you don't. Then, put but then, then, yeah. then your second term in your optimization program is also non-zero. So that means that means you that if you are greater than zero but not great enough. Yeah, yeah, okay, but if you're non-zero, then you care a little bit at least about how the information is contained. But, but then still you, you assign a zero matrix and then there is no information anymore. Yeah, because uh, basically the penalty that you're putting in your optimization problem is uh, irrelevant with respect to the other term of the optimization problem. So you are just minimizing the mutual information between X and if we go back to the problem here, you're just minimizing this quoting because this is irrelevant with respect to this. So you're not taking yeah, into this. It's not irrelevant if beta is greater than zero, right? Sorry? It's not irrelevant if beta is greater than zero. I don't want, beta is something that you choose. But what, what determines this first threshold, for instance? So ah, so then so you have to go to the whole detail. No, so no, no, the first threshold is this one. Okay, but Which is related to the first again value. That's yeah, okay, but my intuition would say that you only assign alpha only zeros if beta it's is like zero, zero. Because that means that you care nothing about the actual relation. So then you assign zeros. Yeah. Because then you still have a random variable and then it's optimal in, in transmission. But if beta is non zero, then you should assign something else than zeros. Not according to this principle. Yeah, okay, well, <laughs> that's the but, that's, but that's weird, right? <laughs> uh, I don't know, it's... So why are... I mean, I don't claim that this is no, no, the this optimal... Is I mean, they don't claim this is the optimal policy to do this. This is a, a way to yeah, just define a problem that you have some information about uh, what you had in X about Y. It is preserved in uh, mm. uh, Yeah, in I just T. wanted to understand why you should decide... Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I will read the paper probably. Okay. So uh, this can be used for the information bottleneck principle in goal-oriented communication, 
once you have obviously this hypothesis that both X and Y you're looking after are jointly Gaussian. And this could be some simple example, it could be a regression problem with when all the two variables are uh, jointly Gaussian. In this case, you know the positive form solution is if you want to perform it here, it is easy to do it, but if you want to, these things to be performed through an edge server and passing through a system, then you can design the system taking into account of this uh, uh, way to adaptively change the size of the information that you put here and adapt the beta according to some accuracy check that you have on, uh, on your uh, performance of the system. So in this way, it has been proposed a, dyna a dynamical resource management where based the beta is changed according to the minimum energy that you want to spend subject to some accuracy and delay constraint. And in a dynamical fashion, depending the random task arrivals, so you have multiple tasks that comes in time at a given speed, and also time varying channel conditions. But then, what would we do if in a non-Gaussian case? Some alternatives uh, are presented by, by, by deep neural networks, and the most related one is deep variation and formation bottleneck. And I will point you to this paper, recently appeared on a journal on selected analysis in communication. You can also try to do some goal-oriented communications trying to make uh, efficient use of the resources by joint source channel coding, putting together the compressive part of your information with the coding part typically used in uh, communication systems. And this is one interesting paper about this. Or you can use compressive encoders together with classical, let's say, view of communication without designing the communication part which is something that we recently presented. So about the variational information bottleneck, this is a picture taken from the paper that I was mentioning. And here you have your source, you have your feature extractor, you have your joint source channel coder, coder of the features and what you have to send to the channel. You have a corrupted vector, and you have here an inference network that does all the job. Let's say the decoding and the inference. And the, what I wanted to point out about this proposal is that they propose, as other people, to break down also another paradigm of communication, which is you have your source, and you typically, we typically talk about, in the last years, about digital communications. You convert your information to bits, and then you transmit bits, mapping them, coding, and mapping to constellation, and so far and so forth. Well, here they propose, no, just transmit, not discrete alphabets, but transmit exactly your features as analog things without passing through the conversions through bits. And it has been proven here in some simple scenarios that these really advantages, advantages by using these neural networks that can be trained uh, and all the stuff that we know, but they are much better performance, especially in a low as an R regime. Probably the first paper that was talking about these things in a well-structured way, it is this uh, uh, IEEE access paper, which is Deep Learning Constructed Joint Transmission and Recognition for Internet of Things, where they propose to say, okay, you want to classify an image, you do it by a neural network. Typically, the neural network can be very deep. You can, let's, let's say, split the neural network in two parts and put the neural networks, the first part, the one that extracts the features of what you want to transmit before the channel encoder, and then uh, you put the other part uh, at the end uh, of the channel decoder, and then you implement also channel coding and modulation by neural networks, and you can train the system either separately uh, by training this encoder and decoder to mimic what is a well-done design, already known by good codes, and you say, okay, I want to emulate this, or you can do it also jointly and train all the system just uh, mimicking the channel. Another, uh, all the things I've been talking so far, uh, I mean, this approach, this, these two approaches, they were not mentioning too much the problem of a resource allocation. And 
So for fixed resource allocation, they were showing that their performance were better. But how to handle the resources in the best optimal way? Well, the first, one of the first proposals mixed with goal-oriented communication is this paper that is on archive in 2022, where they were talking about the problem of having a source of data, do a semantic encoder, extract the meaningful information according to some prior semantic uh, knowledge. Once you have this knowledge, which is the knowledge that is useful to your classification task, you may still compress more, depending on what, on a trade-off on accuracy and latency and energy, and how you can put compress. For instance, you can just select the most relevant features with machine learning techniques. And then you go to a channel encoder and a channel decoder, which are also implemented by deep neural networks. And then you train the system according to some loss functions that take into account both the part of classification by um, cross-entropy loss, uh, and it takes also into account the mutual information that you have in the system, because you want also to maximize how good the information is sent through the system. Okay, this is what has been done from high level uh, recently, so I wanted to point out about the fact that there are several resources, uh, several papers and approaches over there, and want to go a little bit uh, deeper in what we want to talk about the results that we have to show today. So in this uh, paper that I was already mentioning, how to blend together and jointly orchestrate communication, communication, computation, learning, and control, it was important to framework that has been proposed to do it by a proper formulation of the problem and using the Apuno optimization. So this is the scenario we already talked about before, and what was our intuition to mimic what uh, the information bottleneck, bottleneck was doing, Let's try to use something similar to an autoencoder, but use just the first part of the autoencoder. Autoencoder are neural networks that try to reproduce the input through the output passing through an intermediate, restricted, with lower dimensionality uh, representation, which is no longer an autoencoder if you use just the first part, let's say a compressive network. But the point that I want to mention is that we want to maintain complexity under control. So we don't want a very complex networks for all the reasons that I told you about small devices, energy, time of processing, so far so forth, and show that even if the network is not so complex, you can have a lot of advantages doing this way. And uh, so we are using non-expanding convolutional neural networks in this uh, case because we are dealing with images. Uh, with, as an example, uh, we know that convolutional neural networks can handle this job very well. So how to mimic the uh, dynamic change of information that you may have with the tuning the beta parameter inside your loop? Well, we propose to say, OK, uh, first of all, we are not going after a random mapping. Because by a convolution neural network, we are going after a deterministic mapping. This is the first big difference. The second one. Uh, we are using, we are giving to the users and also to the server multiple classification networks, each one with a different compression. And then we, the beta for us becomes, in uh, the optimization of the resources, uh, this compression ratio, which is how many pixels you take of your image passing from the enter, uh, from the input to the output of, uh, of the network. Obviously, the higher the compression ratio, less things you will have to send, but obviously you have distortion, you have less uh, accuracy in your uh, prediction at the end uh, uh, at the edge server. And, but you have to use in couple this one with this one, this one with this one, this one with this one, depend, dynamically. <coughs> How do the convolutional encoders? Okay, the, we have been working both with deep convolutional encoder and short convolutional encoder. So we just go one shot to the compression level with a single layer or with multiple layers. Obviously, these are less complex. 
it requires less computational time that we want to take into account. And how we train? Uh, okay, we train the two. We train it assuming, let's say, a very conservative point of view. So this is kind of a hypothetical thing. Assuming that we are able to use the channel with a very good uh, communication system, heating capacity, we have a guaranteed rate, we don't have errors. So we train offline, let's say, the two without considering the channel, which is something that can be done and will, would improve the uh, realistic uh, results. And okay, we are looking after uh, classification, so we have been using classical, uh, um, classical loss function, the cross-entropy loss for uh, classification, and so we traded together the two parts, this with this, this with this, this with this, and then we use split at the transmitter and the receiver. Okay, so these are just the results which has nothing to deal with the, the real communication part, but is what you will obtain if you, your uh, communication uh, link would be very good. I mean, without any error, let's say, introducing any error on the bits. And you can see that obviously, uh, just to compare, with something that was uh, not the baseline, but something that is the first intuitive thing that you may think about, and you may just do classical signal processing down sampling to distinguish it from uh, computer science down sampling. So not just take one pixel every four, but do also pre-anti-aliasing -ali uh, and do a good job. Because without uh, doing the anti-aliasing, uh, really, it doesn't really work. And, <coughs> and so obviously with the deep, Convolutional encoder, you are able to extract more features, more uh, significant features about uh, your image, and you have better performance as expected than the short convolutional encoder. I'm showing these curves because these curves we need it, because these are, let's say, the functions that we have to use in our optimization problem because we don't know the performance analytically. So we have to use uh, these tables, if you want, as tabular functions in our optimization problem that will be indexed by uh, the compression factor, which is not a continuous random variable, but is a discrete one among uh, a limited set, I would say. Four, five, ten sets of compression factors, something like that. Just to give you an idea of one image, uh, we have been working, uh, the results will show um, classification of road street signals with uh, uh, no, this is uh, the first uh, example that we did, but then we use also another one. Anyway, this is what happens with a compression factor equal to four, and when I mentioned compression factor is uh, over a single dimensionality, so if you want to talk about compression ratio, it would be rho squared. And so these are the lookup tables that we will use in the optimization problem, where we have a compression factor as an index, we have the accuracy, as a function that enters our optimization problem. And we have here, I didn't put numbers, but we have compression costs uh, and uh, both at uh, the computational costs, oh, sorry, both at the transmitter and uh, at the receiver. Okay. The mathematical framework is Lyapunov, Lyapunov uh, optimization. And we have basically to follow these steps, as any, as any optimization problem, you have to define the system model, knowing as much as possible the quantities that you are dealing with in analytical form or in tabular form, as I've been shown previously. <coughs> this formulation relies on a long-term optimization problem, so you want to uh, optimize uh, both objective and constraints on a long-term. You have to define a Lyapunov cost function, you have to go through uh, Lyapunov uh, drift plus penalty, uh, and then you have to solve the problem in a per time slot fashion. So dividing your, the observation of your system in a slot at time, assuming that within this slot all the conditions are stationary, are, are fixed. So you have a fixed channel in this uh, time epoch, then you have another one and possibly obviously correlated, not uh, really dependent, even a little bit different. Then you have to simulate the fact that 
when you are dealing with this kind of services, it is not reasonable to assume that you have exactly a continuous flow of uh, requests of tasks, but they are a little bit random. They may arrive uh, in a bunch, then be signed for a while. So you have to model also the relevant process of this uh, thing and think about also a buffering of this, uh, of this request. So definition of the system model in the example that I've been talking so far, you have to model the computational energy, and we have been using a popular model uh, known in the literature, which scales the energy somehow in a way that is proportional to this cube term of uh, the computation clock. The same can be done at uh, the receiver. These parameters could be, the kappa here could be different from in, uh, at the device at the edge server, obviously. Then uh, we have the transmission energy that enters in the system, which is the optimal ideal if you want uh, uh, transmission energy that comes from inverting the capacity formula. Then uh, what else? We said that we want to buffer our request, so we have to deal with a queue at the transmitter and possibly also a queue at the receiver. Obviously this queue is uh, fed by the output of this queue. And then here we do uh, mimicking what was also proposed in that paper that I've shown before. After we extracted the, the features and we reduced the size, this could be still a little bit too uh, wide as a size. Then we proposed some compression, could be JPEG 2000, just because, as I've shown you, also the compressed version resembles a little bit the image, so this kind of compressor works quite well, but we can use JPEG, standard, you can use what, any, any kind of uh, compression, further compression, and then obviously at the receiver you have to decompress it before coming back, going back to the features. And here, then you have to model how this queue evolves in time, so you have always a question of this kind, where you have the arrival process, so this uh, uh, queue will increase if you have new tasks arriving. And obviously, it will depend, it will be uh, related to the previous value minus the number of uh, images of tasks that you have been completing. Obviously, you, in case this is, uh, for instance, zero, you cannot have a queue that is negative, then you have this max here between zero and the difference between the previous state and how many how many uh, images have you sent? And here is the evolution of what you have uh, at the receiver end, which has uh, uh, something similar to what you have here, obviously, about the image that has, you have been able to classify and uh, what you have before, plus how this Q uh, fed this other Q, which is, let's say, uh, you would say uh, it is this number, so the number of uh, tasks that you have sent, but obviously it is the minimum between these two quantities because also the output here, it, it is the minimum between the two, these two quantities. And then you, <coughs> you need some numbers, which is the uh, definition of some of this quantity here. There is the number of uh, maximal compressible image in a time slot. This is the number of maximal transmittable image in a time slot, which depends on, obviously on the rate, and this depends obviously on the compression factor and on how fast is your device. And so the number of uh, images at the, um, that you want to transmit is also necessary to introduce this uh, further uh, constraint, which is the minimum between the maximum that you could transmit in a given time, epoch, due to the, your channel condition and the energy that you have, but also you cannot transmit more than what you can compress. Because uh, if you have a limited compression capability, maybe you will transmit just what you are able to compress. And the other assumption is that whatever you compress with a given compression ratio has to be transmitted. Because you cannot put in the queue of the transmission, something that has been compressed with a given compression ratio, which is the optimal one for the, that channel condition, and transmit it later when the channel is changed or all the resources are changed, the state of the system is a different one. So this is a constraint in, 
that is taken into account by this equation. Uh, then here is how <coughs> this quantity at the edge servers can be computed. And basically, this computes the maximum number of, uh, of um, image that you can classify depending on the compression ratio that has been used at the transmitter to compress them. So depending on past values, so these are uh, no longer uh, things that uh, you want to optimize because they, they have been optimized at the transmission time. And obviously you have to give, okay, and you cannot obviously exceed uh, your maximum uh, CPU that you are available in a time slot. Okay, okay, okay. And so here is the overall thing and what I've done here, I wanted to highlight the fact that here we have the multiple choices. So here I'm highlighting that the other optimization variable at every uh, time slot is also to select the right problem in the transmission, which will be used then even after a while at the receiver side also. So the uh, resources we want to manage is the transmission rate, let's say at the transmitter side, the compression factor, the clock frequency at uh, user equipment, at the edge server resources is basically in this case the clock frequency that is used to classify. We have this is the simple scenario with a single user, so we don't have other things to optimize. Otherwise, we have to share this uh, clock frequency and so computation cycles at my disposal for different tasks and uh, for different users. So these quantities will influence computation, transmission energy, computation and transmission delay, and task accuracy. So this is a, a possible, obviously it's up to you to define a problem, if it is meaningful. So this is a possible resource allocation strategy, which we call uh, MIDA, which is a minimum average energy consumption under delay and accuracy constraints. So I want to minimize, it is not the only possible you can, minimization that you can do on energy. Here we say, okay, let's take into account all the energy in the system. But you can also say, okay, no, I just want to, I just care about the energy of the user, of all the uh, multiple users in the system. I don't care about the energy that I spent at the edge server. And you can have a similar problem. <clears throat> and then what you do, this is the long term. So this is the expected value of what you um, of this energy that you spent in the system, and you take a long-term average of this, which is what the Apuna optimization framework is capable to solve. And these are long-term constraints. So you, here I'm constraining that the long-term average of the length of the queues, which is related by the little theorem to the delay of the system, is minor of a given quantity. And here I'm constraining the uh, long-term accuracy to be greater than a given quantity. Here are other feasibility constraints, like the fact that you cannot exceed the maximum rate that is allowed probably by a constraint that you have on the maximum power on your device, and that the compression factor belongs to a set of possible compression factors that the, you can change the CPU speed typically on a range uh, a finite set of uh, CPU speed is not a continuous random variable as we deal in our problem at the same at the edge server. Okay, and then this energy could be not just the sum of what you have at the edge server and the transmitter side in computation and transmission, but could be also a weighted average if you like, by parameter alpha. Just to say, you can do more general than this. Then <coughs> changing this parameter, you can say, okay, I don't care about the edge server, I put alpha equal one, I just consider the, uh, the user equipment, or vice versa. <coughs> now, the technical part of how the Lyapunov uh, handled this uh, problem. <coughs> Basically, the Apunov optimization is strictly related to queuing theory, and it solves the problem by converting the overall problem to a queuing pro theory problem. 
And it can be shown that uh, guaranteeing stability of this queue, it is not so easy to prove it, but there is a book on it. Uh, guaranteeing stability of the queue, you are respecting the constraints of, the, of your problem. How you, how you define the queue, you may have physical queue, and we have physical queue in our problem because we are queuing the images. But then you have virtual queues, and you associate a virtual queue to each one of your constraint, long-term constraint. How this queue evolves? Once you have a queue, you need a model of evolution of the queue. And basically what you do, you increase your queue if you are violating your constraint with a step signs that you may choose in order to be faster or slower in the convergence of the system to the optimal solution in the long term. How long is this term? It depends on the step size, similar to what happens with elements algorithm and stochastic algorithm, which is indeed this one a stochastic optimization approach. So here we have two constraints in our problem, which is the delay and the accuracy. So these are the evolution equation for the Q. Then you define the Lyapunov of constraint cost, which is a square function, so a positive function, which takes into account all the, the physical and virtual queues. And then uh, you, have the, you build the Lyapunov of drift, which is how much, on average, this cost changes from one time epoch to another, conditioned on the current state of the system. And then, obviously, you see in this cost function, you have just the constraints. So if you just stop here, you will just have a tool to stabilize this queue and respect the constraint, but without taking into account the real cost function. So how to do that? Then you obviously put a penalty on the stabilization of this queue, of these queues, which takes into account the fact that you want to minimize the expected value of this, uh, of this energy. And B is a, a trade-off parameter on how good you are in respecting the stability of your queue and respecting your, uh, uh, your constraints and how good you are in minimizing your, your function. Quindi, now we know that the Lyapunov drift theorem tells us that if you are able to design a policy that guarantees uh, that this uh, drift is bounded, then all queues are mean rate stable. And thus, uh, for, we have to resort to, it's not easy to solve the problem directly. And typically, this is done by uh, solving an upper bound of the overall optimization problem. Which, uh, why an upper bound? Because it is quite tight upper bound, but it makes the problem solvable, uh, easy to solve, fast to solve, and decapable in uh, many cases. For any Q that evolves according to this equation, which is quite a general equation where you have arrival processes, you have a completed task, and you have the previous state of the Q, it can be proved that this quantity here, which is related to the drift uh, in, some, in some way, is always minor of this quantity. And typically, you can then get rid of these two in your optimization problem and takes into account all, only this part. So in our setting, applying this trick, we end up with a, a bounded version of the Lyapunov drift. Note that there is no more the expected value, because we are going in a stochastic fashion, and so we will substitute expected average with the instantaneous value at the given state. And, and we optimize per slot. And this is the equation we end up with. So this is the part that we don't care about the optimization. These are the part that we care where there is an influence of the optimization variable. And uh, the nice thing is that there is a linear dependence. And we know that uh, if the optimization problem is a linear dependence, dependence is much easier to be solved than quadratic or any other form. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, now we'll skip all the detail of this uh, mark, but at the very end, you have this uh, uh, formal dependence, and this is, uh, and 
neglecting all the parts that do not depend on uh, the optimization uh, variables, we end up with this problem to be solved, where the yellow is the cost associated, the computational cost, and, um, and uh, the energy cost. We have at the edge server, and this is what we have at the user equipment. As you see, the two functions are the couple, so we can solve the problem, minimize separately the two, and solve the problem for the user equipment and uh, for the edge server. So the user optimization problem is just the solution of this term, where each one of these terms takes into account uh, the quantities we are uh, looking after. This is the term that takes into account uh, of the latency. This is the term that takes into account of the energy. This is the term that uh, the transmission energy. This is the compression energy at the device. And this is the terms of the accuracy that we know not formally, but we know to, uh, through the lookup table that I was mentioning before. But the, our optimization variable is a discrete one, so we can just do a search over a finite set, a limited set of a compression factor, which is not too complex. So this is a missing optimization problem, where the optimization variables here, it is the clock frequency we are want to select at the transmitter, the compression we want to select the transmitter, and we have a constraint on uh, the maximum rate that we can afford, depending on the maximum power that we have, etc. Well, actually, uh, for any fixed couple of the integer optimization problem, so if you fix this, these two, this is a, a problem that has a, a closed form solution, which is this one. And once, then you can obtain, let's say you can solve fixing two values of this, you can solve the problem, and you have uh, the optimal solution. Then what you do, you do, you compute the solution for all the possible couples. Let's say you have five uh, possible uh, compression factors, you have three possible frequency, you have to solve this uh, 15 times. But solve is a closed form, you don't have to compute more than a formula, so it is really fast. You have to solve the transition problem, actually. And you have a triplet. And this triplet, you see for this triplet, which one of these, all these triplets is the one that gives you the minimum of this, uh, this function, and you pick this one as your solution. At edge, at edge server, it uh, is a simple problem, <coughs> and it is an integer optimization problem with a limited set of, uh, of frequencies. You just evaluate the function exhaustively, and then uh, you, have, you are done with this problem. OK, this is uh, the state of your system, which is the, a queue, let's say an, an augmented queue that takes into account both the virtual queues that you have defined in your problem and the physical queue that uh, you have in your, uh, in your edge server. What are the simulation results of this approach? What time is it? I have enough Okay. So some simulation parameters that we have been using. So we said we are working in a slotted time fashion. In every time slot, we are assuming uh, a flat fading channel, a single one. But you may also think to extend to multiple flat fading channels, mimicking uh, what OFDM does for you as a job. And each channel is one carrier of your OFDM system, for instance. But here, we are in the simple case. We have a single channel to deal with for uh, the single user. Then we'll see the multi-user uh, scenario, which is not now, will be the next uh, results for a multi-user. The time slot duration has been fixed to 50 milliseconds. I mean, we try to use reasonable numbers in some application, but whichever number we put there, the framework works, and you will have different results, obviously. You have to be careful to define a feasible problem, as always, because if it's unfeasible, you may not have the expected solution, not respect uh, the, the constraints. We have a term that models the path loss, which is different in two scenarios. So we have a very high path loss and a less uh, stringent path loss. 
we are working with this bandwidth, which is uh, 2.5 megahertz. This uh, frequency, 6 and 9 gigahertz, this distance. And we have been uh, using to generate how each channel is correlated to the next one, a classical popular model, which is the GX uh, model with the GX Clark autocorrelation function between uh, two different channels, which depends on the maximum on this uh, on this J0, so we can compute what is uh, the coherence time of the channel, and we set uh, basically this uh, the duration of our time slot according to the coherence time of the channel. Okay, what are uh, the results? <coughs> what I'm showing here, here I'm showing the results at convergence of my algorithm. Suppose it is a stochastic adaptive algorithm that tries to reach the optimum solution iteratively by optimizing at each uh, time step. And here, what is this? This is uh, a curve where we, here we have latency of the system, here we have energy, here we have the bound that we put in our constraint of the latency that we want to have, which is in this case is 0 0.15 seconds. And as you see, all the curves that we have here are respecting the, the, the bound, but some are very good because, in which sense? Because they are ending up exactly at the bound, and this way minimizing the energy. So the solution we are looking after, it is probably this one. What are these plots? These are the solution that we obtain of our problem changing the parameter B, which was the penalty, putting in the stabilization of the Q to try to also optimize our object. So the greater the V, the greater uh, is uh, the penalty in terms of uh, minimization we want to obtain of our objective function. And we end up to the minimum here with very high values of V. If you increase V more, then you will just not respect the or better, you may also respect the bound, but it will take you much longer time to respect the bound. You, you would violate this bound uh, in the mean way. What are the different curves? This is, each one of these curves is for a different accuracy constraint. So, this one is the accuracy constraint greater than 82%. This one is for accuracy constraint greater than 90%. This is for accuracy constraint greater than 95%. This is greater than 97 Obviously, if you increase the accuracy for a given latency, you need more energy. At the same time, <coughs> if you fix, uh, let's say, the energy, you will see that you move uh, for a given energy uh, to different latency with different uh, accuracies. What are the dotted and the, the continuous lines? This is uh, what we obtain with the downsampling as a compressor. So not, nothing sophisticated, just the anti-aliasing filter of the image and downsample with the same downsampling ratio we are using with our neural networks compressing. So there is a huge gap. And uh, what do I mean that these results are at convergence? Here I'm showing the accuracy of the virtual queue. And uh, this is uh, the so this is the virtual queue and this is the accuracy virtual queue. It's not uh, the real accuracy, but how much is increasing this virtual queue. And the virtual queue stops to grow when the bound, the constraint is respected. Because if you remember the update equation of the queue, it was the previous value plus how much you violate the constraint. So you are in convergence where you are not longer violating the constraint. So when this becomes almost flat. Obviously, the step size on how you update your queue, as it happens with LMS, as consequence on how fast you are in reaching the stable condition of the queue, which is also where you are in your solution of the problem. And also it has a consequence on how 
much you move around your optimal solution, the smaller the step size, the slowest is the convergence, but also the lower is the variation. So if you want the variance of your solution around your average long term, because you are optimizing the average and not, for instance, the standard deviation of your solution. So you can improve this by putting also constraints on the standard deviation, although the problem becomes more complex to be solved. Or you may also try to do something else to impose that the probability that you violate the constraint is not higher than a given quantity. And it, this can be put in this framework, converting the probability, which is an expected value, uh, as a time, I mean, as an average of an indicator function. And writing this way, the probability, then uh, you can handle the problem. And what else? Here is also the, um, the effect of V. Also V has an effect on the convergence. So here is a, a value of, a, let's say, small value of V. And this is a high value of V. And this is how much you are, uh, it takes to reach convergence. It has not such a huge effect as a knee in the convergence, but it has its own effect. And obviously, the, the solution you are, we are plotting here, maybe this one, um, correspond to this value of V, which is the greatest one. Okay? And, but remember, it's not important how big is the final value of the Q. The important thing is that the Q is not increasing anymore, which means that your, uh, uh, your um, constraint is not violated. And these curves correspond exactly to the red, to the red Q. This is for the 97% accuracy <coughs> of the proposed solution, not the, of the downsampling. You see that with downsampling, you, we don't have even a curve because we were not able to reach more than 97% of accuracy. OK, here, so these are called latency. These are called trade-off curves, because you clearly see what are the trade-off between the quantities we are dealing with, which is energy, latency, and accuracy. And you can move through these curves to discover your latency. So due to the fact that this is uh, an adaptive and stochastic algorithm, you may say to me, OK, but how do I pick B? Well, basically, you can have a strategy that Either you already, uh, you already dealt with this problem and you know more or less which is the V, which is a possibility. The other one is to say, okay, let's pick a V. I will end up in this point. I'm satisfied with this point, not because I'm saying that I'm far away from the constraint. So I'm too good with this constraint. I can afford up to this delay. Just increase V. I end up to a new uh, stationary point of my queue, I monitor which is the average delay, it is this one, well, I still have space, and I push the V as long as I don't reach the boundary. This, is a, this can be done in several ways. I mean, it's standard um, adaptive algorithms to do that. Uh, here, um, what I'm comparing, yeah. Is the, what is the difference between this and this? I don't, okay, it's the same, I guess. Yes. <coughs> so this is the comparison, uh, again, between uh, deep convolutional encoder and the downsampling. Here is what you obtain if you plug your uh, system with more degrees of freedom. I'm saying, okay, don't use just uh, the short encoder, just uh, the deep encoder, but put them together. You will have more space to explore in the trade-offs. So obviously, the problem becomes more complex because it increases the number, the set of the optimization variable you're uh, working with. And it also, uh, you also need to add all these neural networks some, somehow at your user equipment and also at the bench server. 
Then here we can talk how to implement these different uh, neural networks. We also say, okay, you have, a, let's say, a general neural network, and it is activated just a part of the networks depending on the compression factor. This is a possible line of research for people interested in how to efficiently design a tunable compression factor for a neural network. Or you can say this is, a, is run as a service. Uh, once you need one, uh, it is sent to you. Uh, Anyway, you see this, you can further improve the performance because here we are comparing the results, the trade-off curves between when you use the ensemble of both deep and short and when you just use deep. And this is uh, for the ensemble, this is for the deep, for the same accuracy. <coughs> so the bottom line, we want to be as much as possible on this side. So any curve that is more on this side is a better curve. We can define similarly a maximum accuracy strategy. Here I will go faster because I say almost the same things uh, mathematically as I said so far. So this is the definition of the problem. We just exchanged it. This was a constraint before what was here, and we put here the energy both at the user equipment, we split the two, and uh, at the edge server, and we put them as a constraint. And I want to maximize the accuracy under average latency and user equipment and energy server constraint. Same procedure, you define your virtual queues, you define your uh, Lyapunov the drift, uh, you define your uh, optimization of the Lyapunov drift uh, plus penalty, you remove a expectation, you end up with a similar upper bounds, you minimize this upper bounds and again you are with a problem which is separable in the energy server, in the user equipment. And this is the optimization problem for uh, the maximum accuracy, the mate approach and uh, delay and energy constraint, where you have, again, four terms. One is for latency, one for, is for transmission energy, one is for uh, compression energy, and one is on accuracy, which depends on the compression you want to use the clock frequency you have, you have at the, your device, and the rate that is offered by your channel. <coughs> and again, a mixed inter optimization, I fix the two, I have a closed form solution, exhaustive search over all the possible closed form solutions, I pick the best one, and I'm done. Here, it is the server optimization problem for the mate, uh, where still we have the same mm, complex, Total Q, let's call it, uh, as edge server, the computation one that takes into account both of the virtual queues and the physical queues. And uh, this is a pure integer optimization problem. Again, we just select the best uh, computational frequency and we are done. And these are the trade off curves. They look in a different way because here we said that we wanted. The maximum accuracy, which is the correct classification rate that increases here, so we want to stay as much as possible on this side. This is done for different energy constraints, and the, the continuous uh, lines are for uh, the deep convolutional encoder, this one are for the downsampling, and there is a huge gap. I mean, for a given latency, here we pass from 75% of accuracy to about 90%. Or <clears throat> and always respecting the latency constraints, which was the same that we have been using before, which was at 0 0.15 milliseconds. And you move on these curves, you want to end up as much as possible close to the, uh, your latency constraint in such a way that you save as much uh, in such a way that you have the best possible classification rate. And here we have a plot where we have the correct classification rate versus the energy. This is computed, this plot, taking for the maximum V that we have in all this here. So we are basically looking at what is happening here. And uh, so you see that the ensemble 
the one that has more space where to search for the optimal solution in terms of architecture of the network and also compression is the one that has the best performance in terms of a correct classification rate versus the energy and it has better performance uh, the two different curves are for channel scenario A and channel scenario B. Just to see that if you change the channel scenario, obviously you end up to different solution, depending on which one of the channel is worse, which one that requests more transmission energy, for instance, you have more attenuation, obviously to guarantee a given rate to perform your, uh, uh, your task, uh, you have to put more energy in the system, more transmission energy, otherwise you won't get the enough rate. You have to increase your SNR, blah, blah. <coughs> Multi-user, oh. uh, 10, not so much. So you can also extend the, the topic to multi-user. So you have multiple users, different tasks, different queues. You send through each one orthogonal channels. They are not uh, in this uh, formulation competing for resources. And but we may also add another optimization variable and try to solve it also with respect to uh, the optimization variable assigned the channel, the channel. You go to the edge server, and what I want just to mention <coughs> uh, here is the, the equation that describes how this uh, Q evolves, but the important thing is this one. And in order to solve the problem efficiently, with this Lyapunov framework, we have to change a little bit the formulation of the, not of the problem, but the architecture of the system, how the queues are handled. And so we define it a different queue for each different compression ratio of each single user. So your server and also your, uh, your server has to handle the, this queue separately for every compression ratio and for every user. This is not a big problem. I mean, you need just some indexing memory, but more or less, yeah, it's not so complicated. Doing this, the problems they come all easily. Uh, you, we have linear terms in the optimization variables, and so it's fast to solve. Because the key point about this optimization is that it's very easy. To, I mean, you don't need complex solvers. Any standard PC can run it in uh, just a few seconds, if you want. So even faster, it depends on how much power you have. You solve it really fast. And what we also added, so we did this change, and we had the opportunity not just to use the chain to do classification, but to do also local classification. So the overall system orchestrator has also the option to say, no, no, this time you will do, you will do the job yourself. When, for some reason, you there is congestion in the network, uh, it costs too much in terms of energy, overall, so depending on what is your objective, it could be convenient for you to do the job yourself. So we added an optimization variable here, which are also to optimize if this is equal to zero to one and go through this path or through this path, basically. This is the formulation. Again, uh, long-term uh, objective function, which is energy, long-term constraints, we put constraints for every user in terms of uh, average uh, quality, average delay, and all constraints that could be different on uh, available compression ratio at each user, uh, available clock frequency for each user, etc. And a further constraint here, we have a problem that we, this is a multi-user, then we have also to handle how the CPU at the edge server split its computational power among users. So once we have decided which is the uh, computation uh, that he has to do it, who, how many computation has to do, who is uh, getting the computational power to respect the problem. And uh, we have to also, another thing we have to deal with for a while, how to define the evolution meaningful of the queue. And basically we said that the total queue is governed by this equation, which is the queue we have at each user. So this is the queue for, uh, total queue for uh, the kit user at the user equipment plus an average queue we expect to have in the edge server, which is uh, the average of the queues for each compression level 
that each user can uh, have in a system, which is having for the probability to end up in that queue. And this is uh, something that you can estimate easily after a while with your system, because you say, okay, I'm doing this, the probability can be estimated online by sample average. <clears throat> with this trick, which somehow let us to preserve the linearity in the optimization variable <clears throat> and decouple the optimization. So this trick, coupled with having the queue <clears throat> separate for every compression factor, it is easy to solve the problem. Let's say, okay, same trick, the bound, the math becomes a little bit more complex. This is why I wanted to show the single user because it's easier to explain, but we end up with a similar formulation we have uh, the opponent-based solution. We can split also in this case between user equipment, each user equipment and each edge server and the single edge server that we are considering here. This is the uh, user equipment optimization problem that we can solve. And basically what we have to do, we have this extra problem designed if we transmit to the server, we do it locally. And basically what we do, we solve both the problem and when we have the solution of both the problem, we see which is the best one to minimize our cost function. And then we transmit or not. Um, this is the detail of how it is the solution. I cannot go through all this detail. These are the results. And even here, here we have result for the ensemble, the plus short convolutional encoder versus downsampling. <coughs> and the gray. Here we have the uh, energy versus latency trade-off for a minimum energy strategy. And uh, we, had, we had put the same energy weight between what we spend at the transmitter uh, at the edge server and the, and the user equipment, but this is not necessary, obviously. You will have different curves. And again, there is a, you see, you can gain a lot uh, using this more Information-oriented compression. Here are curves of energy uh, latency trade-off, and here we are showing. Although we optimize the sum of the two, we are showing what happens to the average device energy consumption and what is happening to the average server consumption. So both are gaining. One could gain more than another, depending on the overall condition. You may want to push more here, you change the alpha, and you push more here, the gain, and less here. Uh, different channels and devices, so you can also try to see what happens. Obviously, if you give a better channel to one, it will be favorable for him. You may have more um, energy-hungry devices, uh, which is tuned by this parameter. And this is, this is what happens, so you can distinguish easily and I interpret the result for user equipment 0, 1, and 2. Uh, for instance, uh, user equipment 0 is the one that has the best channel A and best uh, uh, device in terms of, uh, of um, power consumption, the, the one that has uh, less power consumption. And indeed, um, uh, we are in uh, this curve here. Uh, maybe I messed up. Here, let me maximum accuracy strategy. This is so here. No, I, I messed up things, I guess. Ah, this is user equipment two. That's why this is a user equipment zero. Now it's a correct. So, this is the best one, which is closer to this part of the, of the plot. And you see that for a, a given average accuracy, you have less latency. Why the guy, the two, is the worst one because it has a Worst channel and worst equipment, and then for that accuracy, you need you have uh, longer latency. So all the results are interpretable, it makes sense. So it means that uh, the, mm, the the framework is working and is doing what you are requesting. Here is the, here is the result of the offloading uh, for a minimum energy strategy. This is for five devices with different channel uh, conditions, same uh, average arrival rate, same latency constraint, and you see that depending on their condition, some devices do uh, almost similar, 
of loading and the local decision. Someone else has always local, and depends obviously on all this, the mix of the different parameters. We are running out of time, I cannot go too much, but just to tell you, there are several things that you can look at with this, uh, with this approach. Here, I'm pointing out that you can play with different arrival rates, and obviously all the curves will uh, change. This is for one arrival per slot, two arrival, five arrival per, per slot. And obviously here you are in a worse condition for your system, so you need more energy to uh, guarantee the same accuracy, or you need more latency for the same energy, and so far and so forth. And here is just to give a sense of the physical quantity we are talking about, one arrival per slot, two arrival per slot, five arrival per slot, this is the, uh, the average length of the data units, the image that we have in the queue. And obviously, if you have more images that are arriving in your queue, you will have more with a faster uh, speed, you will have an average number of images at the use server. And you see this increases with the parameter V. And same things for the transmission rate. You have more images to transmit, obviously you, have, you stay at a higher transmission rate for different parameters. You cannot do too much here, basically. You have to use all your resources, while here there is space by the parameter V to optimize uh, the system. And here is the transmission power. How much you spend, obviously you spend more for a higher arrival rate. I wanted to give you some physical things, also not just the uh, fact that the uh, algorithm converts and you can explore a lot of issues uh, with this tool. And I think that step size already said that. The only thing, message to take home, the step size does not change, actually, except to numerical uh, approximation, the curves where you end up, the trade-off curves. It changes also the time that you need to end up to one point of this curve. And here is again the effect of the step size to arrive here, you will arrive there in different time. Because you arrive there when you are almost stable in your queue. Uh, future research direction, more realistic assumption. I said I made a lot of uh, ideal assumption, like uh, we have to confine, we may consider a finite VTRO rate at uh, the receiver and the effect on uh, the accuracy that we get. We have to consider the fact that we are not hitting the total capacity because we are in a finite block length regime, so we have to use more careful formula and equations uh, to model the capacity in the finite block length regime. We may put higher order constraints on uh, the averages that we want to obtain, so not just respect on average the delay, but we want to respect it on probability, but it can be handled mathematically with this framework. Realistic application and careful modeling of the system and the performance, the stationary environments and how it, this interplays with uh, the convergence time of uh, this kind of algorithms. Maybe setting an automatic variable step size and penalty V in order to reach the optimal point we want to end up. Extending the framework, it is quite straightforward probably to energy investing scenarios, putting another cost function in the problem. You already did it, not in a goal-oriented communication framework, but in another framework. Uh, more theoretically grounded uh, compression schemes, and the first things to think about is if there is any good solution with variation information bottleneck, and then maybe we, we can ask the Professor Tonello how to do it. And uh, joint source and channel coding schemes, we know that in a finite block, block length regime, you have much better results using a joint uh, compression and channel coding because it is violated the hypothesis of the Shannon theorem of separation of uh, source coding and channel coding. <coughs> and uh, also this is, uh, I think, a very interesting uh, topic, how to deal with a system that do not pass through classical communication system. So this is more disruptive in the sense that what I've been proposing now, it's kind of straightforward to be used with the uh, uh, current uh, 5G and maybe, I don't know, if 6G systems. But 
In this case, you have to reconsider all the system. You are not using QM modulation. You are not uh, looking after a beta error rate. You are transmitting uh, a finite, uh, a continuous alphabet. You just say, let's say, you may consider it as, as a pulse amplitude modulation, for instance, where you, the amplitude could be whatever you like, and you just receive it. So you still use some things that you know about, uh, uh, about transmission, if you want. <clears throat> but then you are just heated by the noise. And the point is, in low as an R regime, this is probably a much better way to go, because in very low as an R regime, it's obvious that your canonical system would give you a decent beta error rate to perform your uh, identification, uh, classification strategy efficiently. Extension to multi service scenarios. Uh, impact of uh, goal oriented communications on another framework which is quite popular, which is uh, federated learning. And this will, this is conclude my talk. Thanks for have the patience to listen to all this stuff and to come here. And the floor is open to questions and whatever you want to do, even to, to take a coffee. Thank you, Professor Benelli, for a very interesting talk. Now it's time for questions. I'm sure that there will be a... Okay, yes? Please pass the mic to uh, the rest. Yeah. Uh, uh, professor, in the results you have uh, discussed that you have considered two channel scenarios. So what are the channel scenarios which you have like, considered in the results? Okay. Here we, as I said, we were considering just flat fading relay channels. But what I did not mention uh, explicitly in, uh, the, in the talk is that the pool of optimization does not rely on statistical information. So whatever is uh, your time of arrival, it is capable to handle it because we didn't use it. Because it is stochastic method that works on the state of the system at that time. Obviously there are issues there because who gives me the information about the channel? Is this uh, information reliable? It is compatible with my uh, delay uh, constraint? So there are things still to be done and to explore and to say that this is something real to be used. As far as the channel, the channel has an impact. Uh, here the hypothesis was a flat fading in each time slot in such a way that if you know the channel, you can consider any WGM channel in that time slot. And we are using in the formulation of the process, the problem, the classical Shannon capacity and the, an achievable rate with zero bit error rate, which is really ideal situation. So again, a possibility is to uh, about, if your question is if it is not flat failing, it's multipath. Well, the problem is much more complex, but I may say, okay, but I have OFTM. And OFTM I can use even with, for instance, uh, not uh, finite alphabets, but with continuous alphabet to orthogonalize, orthogonalize my channel and to make a multipath failing channel is, as a, a bench of parallel, possibly correlated. Uh, flat fading channels and each one of these channels is one resources and then I have an optimization problem with multiple channels uh, to assign to multiple users but it can be handled also by the little bit more complex optimization problem when you have also to put the selection of the channel. I don't know if I answer enough to your question. No? <laughs> Yeah, thank you for your talk. It was uh, very interesting, I have to say. I have two questions, and one of them is what I don't understand yet is so you have this Lyapunov function that you use, and therefore you can separate the optimization between the uh, transmitter and receiver. That's clear. Thanks to the bound. Yeah, yeah, okay. Otherwise, it was coupled. But putting this bound, the problem of the couple, because the bound is the couple in the optimization variables. This is a trick that is well explained in this book of Neely, and it is applicable not always, but several times it works. Yeah. So you have to define correctly the problem, thinking that what you want to explain, what we want to exploit as a trick mathematically. So this is what we did by the parallel, for instance, 
Q for each uh, compression. Okay, but then, yeah, then actually the part that I don't understand is how do you communicate between receiver and transmitter at what rate you are, because you use different okay, decoders. Uh, yeah, uh, decoders. Yeah, this is a good point that I didn't not mention. I was assuming that there is someone that is solving the problem. And this, the, the problem needs to, even if it's separate, needs knowledge of the system. So there is someone that is, uh, it's not a distributed problem that you it's can like solve. It's like almighty God. That's I mean, uh, yeah, otherwise uh, it won't be a joint design of the system if you can do whatever you no, want. No, but I thought that the, due to this bound and this separation, you could indeed solve it. Separately. separately, but it's not exactly the case. Uh, let me check uh, the optimization variables. Uh, the simple one, right? Uh, this is the first line. Okay. Yeah, well, basically, you need to know the state of the system and what are the variables. If those, all these variables, uh, here is uh, the couple. So what you need to know to solve the system, you need to uh, have access to the rate, the transmission rate. You need to know, uh, basically, what is the channel state. And the channel state is something that links you with the receiver. So. You won't know yourself, but the receiver at least has to tell you. Yeah. Okay, so there is some hypothesis here to solve the problem that we need, need to. Obviously, everything depends on <clears throat> how you select your uh, delay constraint. So for very stringent delay constraint, it would be problematic because you need time to estimate, to send back the information. Maybe you have outdated information. A lot of issues. If it is not too stringent, I will answer that I think it's feasible, it's doable. But yes, you need some information that has to be shared. So either you have a central unit that do this job for you and tells you what are the parameters, or you need a direct communication with your edge server. Okay, and then one more question, uh, if that's all right. Um, Obviously, so you need to know also this function, right? You need to know in advance. You have the, you have your classification network that you use uh, split it, let's say, to compress the transmitter and the receiver. But you need to know what is the accuracy at the at the receiver. Yeah. So the system has to give you not only the network but also the table of its uh, uh, performance, which is not too complex yeah. because these are fixed, let's say. Yeah, and then one question uh, with respect to the computational time you quickly mentioned that it's not computational expensive, but is it possible to, because for each time slot you have to compute again and again and again, right? Yes, but you see that our closet form. So you don't have to solve the problem. So we solve the problem and read the Analytically. Yeah, analytically. So close form solution. And then we are at the end. At the end, we have something that is not possible to do it analytically because an integer optimization problem. So we have a cost function. Mm -hmm. You have just to look at the value of the cost function in uh, this five, ten possible compression uh, ratios and pick the best one. This is really easy to do. So in this sense, it's fast because I'm not using a solar array. I'm not using CBX, let's say, or I'm not using uh, any solar at each time. So it is a <coughs> basic script that you can do yourself. Yeah, so that's not a problem. I mean, I, I, I missed some problem, yes, some results yes, that I wanted. So I was uh, telling Francesco, Sorry, can you run uh, these things? And after one second, I had uh, the plot. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that's okay. Okay, that's clear. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, obviously, these networks are quite complex, and the problem is that we have a dramatical increase in the number of devices, especially for. Uh, when we use machine-to-machine -machine communications in IoT. Uh, I would like just to hear your perception on this part related to queuing theory and uh, what we can... Uh, um, should we think in a way that we need to uh, redefine some concepts? And pro uh, for example, you use he uh, here a poison distribution on arrival. 
but uh, where do you see the place for improvement, for example, or what can we expect to, to see in the future in this direction regarding the curing theory? Because classical curing models and approaches probably are not modeled uh, optimally for today's network. Just, just your vision. Okay, first of all, I'm not an expert of curing theory, so that's just take with a grain of self what I'm going to say. Uh, second point is that as some talks uh, have teached us uh, this week, whenever we don't know the statistic, we may try to estimate it in an efficient way by machine learning approaches. So if you need it, obviously, and your statistic will be always in the real world mismatched through any mathematical model you can fit to, to the data, this is a, poss a possible way to go. And this strengthen the, what we have been uh, saying during this uh, week here, uh, the integration of machine learning methods uh, with communications and network management. This is one, uh, one thing. The other thing that I want to stress is that if you are using a framework like this one, although you may have a price to pay in terms of how fast you are in reaching the optimal solution, which means that you will be suboptimal. Not that the system is not working, which is, anyway, uh, an important point, right? I mean, uh, there is no lunch for free, and uh, if we would have the possibility to be optimal at the first moment, uh, this is nice, but uh, not easy. So it means that you will run the system a little bit suboptimally, but you will reach that point. And again, it does not use the assumption of Poisson. So here, the easiest thing to do, let's generate it as a Poisson, which, which is a well-accepted model for time of arrival, but I can use uniform or whatever. Maybe I will have different results because how much the queue is pushed by time of arrival process rather than another, and also the variance will change. But this kind of approach will uh, handle it easily. So in this respect, this approach is nice. Uh, but I agree also with critics. I'm not super enthusiastic on the approach. I'm also critical. And what I don't like that um, it's very easy to handle uh, time averages and long-term time averages. It's not so easy to solve a problem when you have to deal with higher order moments. So, but again, if you want a better result, you have to spend some price and maybe resort to some other trick in upper bounds. If the problems end up to be not exactly convex, you have to cast it as a successive convex approximation and all this stuff that uh, people here know much better than me, but these are possible uh, tools. Thank you very much. Any further question? Now, then it's the time for, uh, let's thank again to Professor. <laughs>